Straight Ahead on Law and Crime Daily. A father pleads for answers in his daughter's disappearance. Whatever you can do to make sure my daughter comes home, I'm asking for that help. Plus, the new body cam video taken just days before Gabrielle Petito disappeared. And Alec Murdaugh behind bars, the prominent lawyer admitting his involvement in a botch assisted suicide plot. Plus, an exonerated attorney working to make change. We are simply trying to redeem justice in our justice system. Jared Adams gives us his take on the Rodney Reed case. And later, it requires that the Aurora Police Department change in meaningful ways so that no more lives are lost. Racially biased policing found after the death of Elijah McClain. What officials say must be changed in Aurora, Colorado. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. We begin with shocking new body camera video that may be the last video taken of Gabriella Petito before she vanished without a trace after a road trip with her fiance. The video came to light as police officers and Petito's parents asked anyone with information about her disappearance to come forward. Well, we share the frustration with, with the world right now. So, you know, two people went on a trip, one person returned. And that person that returned isn't providing us any information. 22-year-old Petito was reported missing on September 11th after her fiancé, Brian Loudry, returned to his family's home in Florida without her. Loudry drove there in Petito's van. Back in July, the pair left for a cross-country road trip that was cut short. Petito is believed to have last been seen near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Two weeks before she disappeared, Petito and Loudry were pulled over for a domestic disturbance. Body cam video shows Petito in an emotional state. I don't know, we'd have been fighting all morning and... <laughs> And he wouldn't let me in the car before. And then Why I, wouldn't he let you in the car? Because <laughs> you told me, need, told me I needed to calm down. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm perfectly calm. I'm calm all the time. And he really stresses me out. And I just... And this is a rough morning. Police officers in Utah later determined Petito had slapped Loudry and that she suffered from anxiety. Officers considered it a mental health crisis, not a domestic abuse incident, and helped separate the couple for the night. Yes, they had a disturbance. Yes, it was captured on uh, body camera, their interaction with law enforcement. But beyond that, you know, I don't know what it has to do with the disappearance. In a press conference Thursday, Northport Police in Florida confirmed they know where Loudry is, but that he is not cooperating with the investigation. Why does he get the privilege to tell you no, that he's not coming in to speak to you? Because the Constitution protects that. Petito's father is now speaking out in a plea for help. I'm asking for help from everyone here. I'm asking for help everyone at home. I'm asking for help from the parents of, uh, of Brian. Officials say they're working with the FBI and police departments in the western United States to find Petito. She's not here, so where is she? Joining us today is trial attorney Anna Yum and Terry Hostin. Anna, and I'm torn. Loundry's got his right against self-incrimination, the, as the officer said there, but this looks horrible. If he was your client, I don't know, would you advise him to speak and get ahead of this or stay silent? Well, that's an excellent question. It really depends. And listen, this is a heartbreaking situation because from a legal perspective, absolutely, if you're a criminal defense attorney, your obligation is to protect your client. And he has a constitutional right against self-incrimination. So if, he, if there's a situation where you're talking to your client and your client potentially is implicated, then of course, if you're the criminal defense attorney, you have to advise your client to remain silent. Now, just because he ends up lawyering up doesn't necessarily mean he's guilty. He has a constitutional right. So if you take your lawyer hat off, though, and if you take your criminal defense attorney hat off, and if you just think of it from a public opinion perspective, then of course, uh, her family has every right to want answers and to have answers as to why she didn't come back and why he came back alone. So it is a very tough question and a very fine line. Absolutely. Terry, we've seen a dozen of these missing persons cases. How do you think investigators will go about finding Gabby Petito? This case is all about forensics, Brian. There's no question they're going to look into that white van. They've already said they have the van. They're searching it. They're getting evidence from the van, and they're going to figure out what was in that van before she disappeared. They're also going to look at cell phone records and try to figure out where each of them was before that disappearance. And I think the fact that they're coordinating with the FBI and local authorities is very important. That gives them far more resources than they would have if they were just 
looking at this individually. But really, Brian, they have to follow what's going on with Laundry. I'm assuming they might be even recording his records. So we'll see what happens. Absolutely. Definitely checking not only, like you said, the cell phones. Maybe the cell phones are traveling together. Maybe they were separate. That's something that I'm very interested to see and see how this plays out altogether. Thank you both. The father of a family accused of killing another family appears in court days after his wife agrees to testify against him. Billy Wagner is accused in the 2016 execution-style murders of eight members of the Rodin and Gilly families in Pike County, Ohio. Just last week, his wife Angela pled guilty to her role in the murders and agreed to testify against her husband and son. Billy and Angela's son, Jake, pled guilty earlier this year. Billy's attorneys say they just received copies of Jake and Angela's confessions. He'll be back in court in November. Ex-Minnesota police officer Derek Chauvin enters another not guilty plea to federal charges that he violated a teenager's civil rights. Chauvin appeared in court Thursday via Zoom from prison. Chauvin faces federal charges stemming from the incident in 2017. Officials say he repeatedly hit a 14-year-old boy over the head with a flashlight and held him by the neck. Earlier in the week, Chauvin appeared in federal court for other charges stemming from the 2020 death of George Floyd. Chauvin and three other ex-officers, Tu Tao, J. Alexander King, and Thomas Lane, faced charges of depriving Floyd of his constitutional rights. In June, Chauvin was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison for Floyd's murder. Testimony in the federal trial of Elizabeth Holmes reveals her blood testing company wasn't using human blood samples in its quality control test. Holmes was CEO of the now defunct Theranos, a company she claimed would revolutionize blood testing. But as witnesses explained on Wednesday, there were many problems with the testing units. Oftentimes, they said the tests wouldn't produce the same outcome twice and were unreliable. The former billionaire faces 12 fraud charges in connection to her time with Theranos. Her trial expects to last for weeks. And the prosecution is preparing to rest soon in R. Kelly's sex trafficking and racketeering case. Testimony has been ongoing for nearly a month, with several accusers taking the stand to testify about R. Kelly's alleged abuse. A judge recently admitted tapes dating back to 2008 that include recordings of the R&B singer screaming and then assaulting a woman who allegedly lied to him. The jury has listened to these tapes, but due to lack of cameras in federal courtroom, it's unclear what the reactions were to these recordings. Court was dark on Thursday, but testimony is set to resume on Friday, where it is expected that the government will rest their case. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, a verdict could be coming in Robert Durst's murder trial. But first, a prominent South Carolina lawyer admits to hiring a hitman to carry out his own murder. What's next for Alec Murdoch? Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. Prominent South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch turns himself in on charges related to an unbelievable plot to kill himself. In a story that the Law and Crime Network has been following for weeks, Murdoch says he hired a former client to shoot and kill him so his son could collect a $10 million life insurance payout. On Thursday, Murdoch was arrested and booked into the Hampton County Detention Center in South Carolina. Murdoch was shot in the head on September 4th, but survived. Earlier this week, 61-year-old Curtis Edward Smith was arrested in connection to the shooting. In an exclusive interview courtesy of the Today Show, Murdoch's attorney claims this plot was unrelated to the deaths of his wife and son. Both were found murdered at their home in June. Let's talk about Megan Paul here, Dick, because your, your client lied about the circumstances under which he was shot. It, it wouldn't be a stretch for folks to think that he probably also lied about the circumstances under which his wife and son were shot. Well, that, that, uh, and I, look, I've spent the last year and a half with Maggie and Paul and Alec. I represented Paul on the boat case, um, met with them dozens of times. Uh, they were very affectionate. They, they Maggie and Paul uh, and Alec all together, uh, Paul and, I mean, Maggie and Alec, 
holding hands. He is totally distraught. I've, we've talked to him at length about it this week. Uh, clearly, he is distraught about their deaths. But, but he did, he, did, did not did, murder did, them. No, Alec has released on a $20,000 uh, personal reconnaissance bail and had his passport surrendered. But let's bring in trial attorney Anna Young and co-host Terry Austin to discuss more. Terry, with authorities knowing that Murda is capable of a murder-for-hire plot, do you think this will cause them to reevaluate not only the death of his wife and son, but also these previous murders? No doubt about it, Brian. Where there is smoke, there is fire. His wife, who was only 52, his son, who was only 22, were both found shot and killed. They don't know what the, happened with that or whether he was involved. Then, of course, this bungled suicide attempt, which we don't know much about yet, except we do know the other individual involved. But the housekeeper who was found dead, she tripped and she fell, and that was back in 2018. And it was on their home at the premises. So that was still a little bit odd. And then the boat accident with Mallory Beach, the 19-year-old girl, that was supposedly an accident. But now that all of these people around him are turning up dead, yes, it's a problem. They're going to look into it. A lot of questions and few answers as yet. Anna, Murdo's charges, insurance fraud, conspiracy to commit insurance fraud, and filing a false report doesn't really sound like a murder for hire. Could there be more charges coming? You know, Brian, I think that's going to be a stretch. You, you talk about the facts in this case, and you're thinking to yourself, geez, this is something that I possibly could have seen in a law school exam, because there's so many convoluted facts, to Terry's point, and there's so many different issues that are coming up. I think it's going to be very difficult for the prosecutor to sit there and charge him with um, a murder for hire or attempted murder of himself. How, how is that even possible? I think that's going to be extremely hard. I think it's going to be an uphill battle. I think that this evidence is relevant for purposes of insurance fraud and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud, things of that nature. But in terms of any kind of murder, uh, attempted murder charges or anything like that, I don't see that happening. Yeah, I think you're right there. Are definitely uh, a law school problem that someone else will have to figure out. I graduated far too long ago. I'm not going to touch that on a 10-foot pole. Thank you. Uh, and we are officially in verdict watch in the state of California as the jury weighs the fate of accused murderer Robert Durst. The real estate heir is charged with the 2000 murder of his best friend, Susan Berman. She was found in her home, shot in the back of the head. Prosecutors claim Durst killed Berman because she was going to give information to authorities about his wife, Kathy, who went missing in 1982. Though a body was never found, prosecutors think Durst murdered Kathy. The jury heard three months of testimony. Durst spent 14 days on the stand. The jurors must consider whether Durst is guilty of killing Susan Berman because she was a witness to a crime. They asked to see a timeline of events brought it up in closing arguments. The judge denied this request since the timeline was not in evidence. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, bias policing revealed after the death of Elijah McClain. What's next for the Aurora, Colorado Police and Fire Departments? But first, Law & Crime Daily sits down with attorney Jared Adams. How his wrongful conviction created a drive to exonerate others in need. An exonerated man turned defense attorney now works to free other innocent inmates. In 1998, when he was just 17 years old, Jared Adams was wrongfully convicted of sexual assault and sentenced to 28 years in prison. During the nine years that he served, he began to study the law. Upon his release, he hit the ground running, working to bring fairness to the criminal justice system. His latest case focuses on death row inmate Rodney Reed, who was convicted in 1998 of abduction and rape and murder of Stacey Stites. Reed's DNA was found inside Stites' body, but he says he had a consensual relationship with her. Reed was scheduled to be executed in 2019, but a permanent stay was later granted to review his claim of innocence. As Jared Adams works to be free Reed, our very own Terry Austin sat down with the exoneree who explains how he plans to make his mark on the justice system. Can you tell us a little bit, Jared, about your story? So we go to a party where we were accused of a sexual assault um, by a young lady and with no evidence at all other than the accusation, we were believed to be guilty um, and, and, you know, not given that presumption of innocence at all. You wrote a book called Redeeming Justice. Tell us what made you write that book. What's the book all about? I got this law degree 
And I kept thinking naively that once I got this law degree, I would be able to cure all the ills, right? All of the black mothers who are sitting there worried to death about their sons, like me and my mother was. I thought that I would have this law degree and be able to tackle it all. I learned that this is just, it's like spooning water out of the ocean, unless you have the support of the community and the, the, the folks in the legal world as well to move towards what justice, equality, and fairness is. One of the people that you helped are currently helping is Rodney Reed. He was convicted in 1998 for the murder yes. of Daisy Seitz. I was fortunate to get employed by the Innocence Project as their first litigation fellow who was exonerated. And, and simply put, without using all of the big words, this is what I want to say about the Rodney Reed case. It is extremely questionable. We believe that Rodney is innocent of what he was accused of. But even if those who aren't willing to come to where we are in Rodney's belief, there's no way that you can't agree that it is so many questions in this case that man deserves a new trial. We try to take cases and litigate claims of actual innocence. And through doing so, we try to get the world's legislators, everyone's attention to say this. The criminal justice system is man-made. Man makes mistakes. But when it comes to mistakes in lives, a case can be overturned and reversed. The damage of loss of life can never be. Turning now to Ohio, where both sides rest in an arson murder trial. Stanley Ford is accused of setting three fires in his neighborhood. Two of those fires resulted in the deaths of nine people, including a family of seven whose children were all under the age of 15 years old. Testimony lasted nine days, the defendant did not testify, and the defense elected not to call any witnesses. The last witness called by the prosecution was Patrick Boggs, the ex-husband of one of the victims. Boggs previously served 12 years in jail for dousing his wife with kerosene and threatening her with a lighter. Boggs was briefly detained for setting the 2017 fire that resulted in his ex-wife's death, but police later released him. Boggs, who was in jail for another domestic violence case, appeared in court on Wednesday. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Go ahead and have a seat, Mr. Boggs. And at this time, do you choose to testify? I choose fifth, plead the fifth, and did not testify at all. So you're choosing to in, um, in, invoke your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So if you were called to testify, any questions you would be asked, you would invoke the Fifth Amendment, is that correct? Yes. And you would choose not to answer any questions? Yes, ma'am. When we come back, a civil rights investigation in the city where Elijah McClain was killed. What the Colorado Attorney General has to say about what the investigation revealed. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. Following the death of Elijah McClain, a civil rights investigation into the Aurora Police and Fire Department found that there was a pattern and practice of racially biased policing and excessive force. Investigators reviewed more than 3 million records, about 3,000 police reports, and analyzed internal data from the Aurora Police Department and Fire and Rescue Department. The investigation found officers would apply more force than was needed without giving people the time to respond to commands. Attorney General Phil Weiser says these failures are systemic and show severe cultural challenges created by the department's police culture, flawed discipline challenges, and hiring issues. In a statement, A.G. Weiser said these actions, quote, hurt the people the law enforcement is entrusted to protect and they destroy community trust. Now Weiser is calling for cultural and leadership changes to police and fire departments. I sat down with Mari Newman, who represents Elijah McClain's family, as the investigation was ongoing and got her thoughts about the probe. To the Aurora Police Department, which, as you and I discussed last time, has a long-standing and horrible uh, pattern of both racism and brutality that has gone on for decades. I've been suing them for decades, and surely uh, it began long before that. And so that investigation is also ongoing. And my hope is that that will result ultimately in a consent decree, which requires that the Aurora Police Department change in meaningful ways so that no more lives are lost. And can the results of this probe be used in the criminal case or civil case involving Elijah McClain? And if so, how? 
Well, I think in a civil case, it, it possibly can, just to show that there's a pattern in practice. Because remember, in a civil case, it's all about damages. It's all about the money, you know, whether the city or the Aurora Police Department is liable or responsible. So I can easily see this kind of information being showcased in a civil trial. In a criminal trial, not as much. I don't, I don't think that, that's, that would necessarily happen. And if I'm the criminal defense attorney, I'm fighting like crazy to try to keep that out. Because in a criminal case, it's not about damages. It's not about money. It's about whether the government can prove that a person committed a crime on a particular day. So unless there's footage to show that these particular officers engaged in that type of behavior before, I would argue that that causal nexus is not there. And so, of course, I would be arguing to keep that out. I'd agree there wholeheartedly on both points, both civil and criminal aspect. Terry, the death of Elijah McClain appears to have uncovered serious problems in Aurora, Colorado. Should we expect the DOJ to follow up with federal charges? Brian, I think the federal DOJ will wait and see what happens on the state level. I think Attorney General in Colorado found this pattern of practice and did a thorough investigation. It's really one of the first kinds of this type of investigation in Colorado. And there also is a police reform bill in Colorado. And under that reform bill, the agency who was accused actually has 60 days to implement the changes. And we know that the attorney general had multiple changes that he wanted to see done in the state. And if, in fact, the agencies take the time and the effort to change their policies to implement the changes, I don't think that we'll see federal action. I agree as well, but we'll see how it plays out. Thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.